So welcome everyone to our next session, which is around the Internet of Hospital Things and the Connected Doctor. Uh, just to set the stage, uh, our goal for the next 35 minutes or so will be to really understand how the entry of healthcare into the digital age is impacting the hospital. And I think it's especially cool to talk about this now because we normally think about healthcare as this field that's very slow to change and resistant to evolve. Uh, when we talk about the hospital, we're not just talking about one type of consumer, we're actually talking about a full ecosystem. So whether it includes uh, payers or regulatory bodies, patients, and at the end of the day, a lot of the discussion should evolve also around those that develop the technologies and physicians who at the end of the day will use these technologies and whose buy-in is really important. And so uh, our panelists today have quite diverse backgrounds to represent these different point of views. And uh, with that, I'll let them quickly introduce themselves. Uh, hi, I'm Gazelle Rastegar. I'm the VP of Business Development with uh, Hygienics, a healthcare IT company. Our focus is to help hospitals reduce hospital-acquired infection. And um, what we, the solution we have is a wearable device, very much like a fitness tracker, that communicates with a series of sensors in a hospital environment to inform the healthcare workers as to the right time and place to conduct hand hygiene. And it provides them feedback. Great. Hi. My name is uh, Barrett Larson. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Leaf Healthcare. And what we do is take the power of wearables and apply that to the hospital setting. So we use the wearable technology for very specific applications in the hospital environment, uh, namely to coordinate mobility protocols. And I can tell you a little bit more about how that all works, but um, that's Leaf. And I'm Jack Stockard. I'm a licensed physician, although I don't practice at this time. Uh, I am helping build Health 2047. It's a, a, an endeavor started by the American Medical Association. So we have an anchor investment from them uh, to scale an innovation company focused on generating collaborations between health benefits companies, providers, and product companies within the healthcare space, but also importantly, bridging that gap into the enterprise technology, consumer technology, and um, general information internet of things here in the Valley. So I am based here, although the AMA is out of Chicago, and I'm, I look forward to talking about the variety of different things that we have on the panel today. Absolutely. Awesome. And so I figured maybe we'd start by having the three of you share your thoughts on how the hospital has transformed most since entering the age of IoT. So think maybe in the last five years or so. Sure, I'll start. Um, one of the very specific issues around hospitals is it's a very unique environment in that the type of patient entering and exiting, and unfortunately, uh, with the rise of superbugs and uh, the development of um, antibiotic-resistant bacteria, um, they have become a contaminated space. And oftentimes, a lot of infections happen in the hospital that were of no fault of the patient themselves. And um, the environment is changing in that uh, the regulatory uh, bodies have decided that these um, incidents are, are never events and they should not be reimbursed. So in the past five, six years, that's um, some, some of the trends we have seen. And, and we think that the hospitals are going to change by addressing some of these problems that occur. Go ahead. Yeah. So I'm a, a physician by training, and I still continue to practice clinically. And the biggest thing that I've noticed in the last five, 10 years or so is the, the birth and the evolution of the electronic medical record. So when I first started medical school, everything was on paper, pen and paper. Um, it seems hard to imagine now, but you had all the entire patient medical record and, and binders, leaflets of, of paper all over the place. If you needed to get information on a, on a particular patient, you had to go down to medical records and search for uh, you know, folders. It was just incredibly inefficient. And then uh, about halfway through my medical training, um, in comes this new thing called the electronic medical record, which people were initially, seemed to be pretty afraid of, actually. And then now we've just become hyper-dependent on it, and it's hard to imagine practicing medicine without that technology. So uh, it's been fun to, to witness that. And 
No, so while I appreciate the question and, and my colleagues' points on the change that we've seen in the hospital, certainly medical records being one and the different application of technologies in the hospital being another great place. You know, I'm more interested in the evolution of healthcare in general. So if you think of the world we're in today, 80% of our spend is on chronic diseases now. We frankly have gotten really good at treating the emergent things and helping people live longer. And what that's meant for the healthcare system and for innovation in general is the, the, the movement is to a more continuous engagement, right? And that's what the Internet of Things is about. It's about it, the reality is that the majority of people in their, in their lives don't self-identify as patients, they're individuals. And the question as a healthcare world, as I went through it in my training and now where I'm at with Health 2047, is really about how we think differently about the physician's ability to engage with technology to deliver new models and new ways to take care of larger populations of people with different types of diseases. Now it's not as much about how, what the percentage is dying of heart attacks coming in the front door of the ER, it's about how are you managing your chronic disease diabetic population. A very, very different type of question. And although the in-hospital technologies are important to consider, I think more interesting in this last kind of four to five years and what we're seeing and why we're all here today is on that other front. It's on how do we actually use technology to consume health better, to live healthier lives, but then I think the flip side of that from the physician perspective is how do we actually deliver new and different ways of care? Absolutely. I think that people right now are starting to view health as this thing that's not just restricted to the hospital environment or the four walls of the hospital, but rather is something that's more of a continuum, and I would love uh, to talk more about it soon. Um, Jack, I do have a question for you, and it's around uh, wearables. So when we think about IoT, I think that for a lot of us, the first thing that comes to mind is wearables. There's a lot of hype around these technologies, and yet questions around their value remain. So um, actually, how many people in the room own a wearable? Can you raise your hand? Mm -hmm. Awesome. And how many of you still use your wearables? There we go. And I think um, this is just to show, I, I mean, there's crazy stats out there saying that if we take Fitbit as an example, because there's lots of Fitbits out there, a third of users stop using their device after six months. And I think that a lot of it is around what value do users get from the device? How does data on my steps correlate with a behavioral change? Um, but when we're talking about the hospital setting, there's also other challenges for wearable devices. So whether that be uh, integrating the data, whether that be presenting the information to the doctor at the correct time. And so, Jack, I was curious from your experiences, what are these challenges that you see? To me, there's two core issues at the heart of this. Uh, the first is one related to the clinical nature of the innovations that we see, and the second's related to really the business models around them. Uh, so maybe I'll start in the flip. So if you think of wearables, Internet of Things, devices, or the like, and how you get paid for things in healthcare in this world, uh, they're really to oversimplify it, four main paths, right? You either go through the provider and some sort of population health solution that they can engage their population with. You can sell that through the ACO or what have you to manage a population and they can make more on the return of their value-based care contracts or whatever it might be. But the provider as a revenue source. The second source being the consumer. Uh, so we've seen Fitbit and others make great strides in the consumer market but struggle as they try to then push into more clinical relevance. Uh, the third, place that you can be paid is everything outside of reimbursement by payer. So whether that's all the self-insured market sales and companies that you've seen come up where they articulate an ROI for a given population, uh, or a lot of the population health uh, solutions that we've seen in the market. And really the fourth and the hardest to get, and we heard it a little bit uh, commented earlier, uh, was is the reimbursement path. That's the $3 trillion market. And the question that often gets asked then is related to my second point of issue with these, which is, it really comes down to clinical utility and how to make sure that that data is actionable. So I, I don't necessarily care how many steps you talk, it took yesterday, last week. I actually don't really care about the trend of it either, unless, unless I see some sort of clinical improvement in something that you're suffering from. What's the functional outcome that's better? You are able to walk further after surgery. You are able to you know, do 
activities that you weren't able to do last year because you had diabetes and you were over it last year. Now all of a sudden, if we can somehow get to a point of clinical relevance, that's where it starts to be meaningful. So I think the balance of moving into the reimbursable realm, that fourth realm, because we've seen on the other three, providers are certainly paying for things. Consumers don't want to tend to buy anything um, in healthcare. And the payer world, self-insured employer sales, have come back as a stickiness point on the ROI question. The reimbursable model is really going to be driven by the clinical utility and actionability of it. And that's as much on physicians to change behaviors, uh, certainly, and the way we engage, but it's also on the, on the companies being enabled to actually innovate in that space. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so when we think about uh, IoT and health, we oftentimes think about the patient, right? How do we improve clinical outcomes by monitoring the patient, et cetera? Um, Gazelle and Barrett actually created two very interesting technologies, uh, which I will let them expand upon just shortly. Um, but Gazelle's keep in mind that her technology is really helping um, hospitals avoid hospital acquired infections by monitoring doctors, which I think is quite neat and cool. And uh, Barrett's technology, they do monitor patients, but at the end of the day, the technology isn't just allowing for better clinical outcomes, it's also allowing hospitals to improve their workflows. And so uh, can you guys tell us more about your technologies and how you're bringing those to the hospital, given what Jack just said? Sure. Go ahead. Yeah, so a couple things uh, you said that caught my attention. One, clinical relevance, and two, actionable data. I mean, those are like, absolutely key and fundamental. So um, for me, it, it was uh, starting with a, a problem and translating that into a clinical need. And sometimes it's, there's so much cool technology out there. You try, you can sometimes get into this position where you try to put technology into a, into a problem as opposed to working backwards from a problem and then defining the clinical need and developing solutions around the clinical need. So um, in my experience through LEAF, it, it started with a patient experience, an encounter, and I became aware of this problem of pressure ulcers, bed sores. And um, for those of you that are not familiar with this problem, it is a problem of epidemic proportions. Uh, millions of patients every year going into hospitals are coming out with these chronic wounds, bed sores, pressure ulcers, which are a source of significant morbidity and mortality for these patients. Um, they can even be lethal. So Christopher Reeves, um, I'm sure you're all aware of it, actually died from an infected pressure ulcer. So they're very serious. And the irony is they are totally preventable, by and large. Uh, it's no mystery how you prevent them. You just make sure that patients are turning and moving and mobilizing and not staying stuck in one position for too long. The problem is, you and I, when we're sleeping at night, you respond to those normal pressure cues. You actually shift your weight and shift your body. You're doing it now. You don't even realize you're doing it. But patients that are hospitalized, patients that are sick, elderly, medicated, delirious, they don't necessarily respond to those normal cues, and thus they're at risk for pressure injury, pressure ulcer. So um, hospitals have installed these protocols for making sure that patients are turned and they don't have pressure building up in any given area of the body for too long. So virtually every hospital in the country has a turning protocol. Most hospitals use a two hour turning protocol where every patient at risk for a pressure ulcer is basically turned as if they're on a rotisserie every two hours around the clock, day and night. And it's horribly inefficient the way it works. It's not well executed. Compliance rates with these protocols are uh, horrible. Uh, to put it mildly, they just don't work. And because of that, pressure ulcer rates continue to be high. And even today, 3.6% of patients that walk into a hospital will develop a hospital-acquired pressure ulcer. And um, because they are totally preventable, they're considered never events, they're not reimbursable, hospitals are on the hook for them, they get fined, they get penalized, it opens up the hospital litigation. So it's a, it's, a, it's a big problem that not a lot of people are aware of, but what we're trying to do at LEAF is solve it through technology. And getting back to this concept of actionable data, what we do is we put a sensor on the patient. It's very simple, consists of uh, an accelerometer, essentially, three-axis accelerometer, and it's constantly monitoring the position and the movements and the activity of the patient, understanding where pressure is building up on the patient's body, and distilling that down into a concrete little message that tells a nurse if a patient needs to be turned in order to avoid a pressure injury. Very simple. Uh, multiple layers of redundancy, so if that patient doesn't get turned, other people can see, it allows accountability. 
and it, it's been shown to be phenomenally effective. So hospitals using the system are reducing their pressure ulcer rates by over 80%. So it, it really does, uh, does work. And it's, in, in essence, it's a very simple concept, but aided by technology. And if the patient turns on their own, for mm -hmm. example, the mm -hmm. nurse doesn't need to go and yeah. turn them. Yeah, and that Just gets to the, the efficiency part of the equation. So without this type of technology, nurses are not able to continuously monitor patients. So oftentimes, any turn that a patient does on their own, if it's not witnessed and it's not documented, essentially didn't happen. So nurses may go in and turn patients that perhaps were actually turning adequately on their own, but because it wasn't documented, um, it induced extra work that wasn't necessary. So by constantly monitoring every patient at risk, nurses can focus their attention on those who need it most and at the same time make sure that nobody's neglected. Uh, specifically around, uh, for hi around um, this problem Hygienix is looking to solve, um, our founder actually lost her uncle to hospital-acquired infection. And uh, she went on this journey to solve and uh, figure out a solution. And um, the company is currently in its uh, third uh, version of the product. Um, let me give you a perspective of the problem we are looking to solve. Uh, Hospital-acquired infections roughly occur to about a million patients. And out of the, that million patients a year, about 100,000 deaths occur. Um, it, this costs the United States healthcare system uh, in the range of $40 billion. Um, as I mentioned, it is considered a never event and preventable, um, which um, actually is supported by quite a number of studies as hand hygiene increases, the number of hospital-acquired uh, infections decrease. So there is definitely a lot of incentives, um, lack of reimbursement, the penalties issued. There is a mandate by the government to report hand hygiene numbers, compliance. And there's also a government website that records, reports the infections that happen in the hospital. So there is a very large consumer advocacy uh, group that informs patients to make a, a good choice in the hospital they go to, as well as there's um, a litigious environment in the healthcare setting that um, are willing to, there's actually quite a number of blogs that are willing to take on cases and um, there's actually outrageous settlements for um, hospital-acquired infections. So this is the sort of um, uh, environment uh, we are operating in and our solution is to provide this wearable that communicates as I mentioned earlier with a series of sensors around the patient bed and in hallways that um, inform when they are entering a patient zone and the rule engines in the wristband knows whether this healthcare worker has conducted hand hygiene prior to touching the patient. The protocol currently for um, hand hygiene is some hospitals are two specific, uh, two different um, sort of protocols, either before um, and after touching the patient, or every single time they are uh, touching a catheter or um, taking maybe touching bodily fluid. So there are very specific things, and we are modifying our technology to address all of the key patient care points for the healthcare worker to um, conduct hand hygiene. And, um, and it's turning out that it's um, quite effective in some of the trials that we have conducted. We saw a doubling of hand hygiene compliance, as well as a three-time increase in uh, either soap or hand sanitizer usage. And oftentimes, hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer usage is used as a proxy of hand hygiene. And um, another thing that our technology solves is it measures the duration of wash. And the reason that's important is at five second soap wash, only 50% of germs are reduced based on the scientific um, paper. And it's really at 30 seconds um, wash with soap or 20 seconds with alcohol that 100% of the germs are completely eradicated. So um, we've seen that Oftentimes, the duration of wash increased from 10 seconds to 25 seconds, which makes it a safer environment for both healthcare workers, health, as well as the patients. Awesome, thank you. Um, so I'd like to go back now to the health as a continuum idea, and that is because 
there is evidence that there is uh, both positive clinical and uh, economic outcomes to focusing on preventative medicine as opposed to reactive uh, medicine. Gazelle, it sounds like your type of technology could also be used outside the hospital to ensure hygiene? Absolutely. Um, health is a continuum. And uh, one of the areas that we are focusing on as well is the hospitality and the service industry. Um, I mentioned earlier that the cost of hospital acquired infections in the US is about 40 billion. You'd be surprised to know that the foodborne illnesses uh, cost around $77 billion to the, um, healthcare, uh, to the healthcare system, actually. So uh, there's a continuum, obviously, uh, in terms of uh, food management, but when it comes to uh, restaurant and service industry, um, a lot of these foodborne in illnesses are because of hand cross contamination. So we're looking to also address that market, and I think together, um, with a focus in healthcare and the service industry, we can make quite a difference in, in how infections are re reduced. Mm -hmm. And then, um, Jack, I'd love to hear your thoughts on what you think it takes for a patient or an individual to never enter the hospital if, you know, so. <laughs> All right, but if, I, if only I could come If up only with genetics that. weren't um, a problem. Yeah, you know, it, it struck me listening to Barrett talk about um, the in-hospital things and what I, I think of the flip side of the productivity argument and the shortage of physicians and how are we going to take care of everybody. Um, and it's really about providing different tools and different models to make physicians scalable. Let's scale stuff off of them uh, and that they don't need to be taken care of. Let's do things with technology that we could otherwise um, in every other walk of life have used technology for. And you start to see some of the trend towards that, right? So I think the um, last year's and end of 2015, you saw some of the first preventative care CPT reimbursable codes come out. Uh, I know there's a whole bunch of different uh, restrictions around how to actually be reimbursed for that. But what that was about doing was starting to move the market towards models that would enable preventative care engagement and then compensation for that. Uh, I think where we need to get to is, you know, you can imagine a physician who is much more like the, the pilot in the, in the cockpit who has certain dashboards that they're getting around their chronic disease patients, well, and they manage those patients in a different way. And you might triage the bottom ones and say, keep a virtual care plan running. You might say this set, oh, well, we need to bring John in and Sally in because you know, we've used virtual care plan for the last four months and then our hemoglobin A1C is still out of, out of whack. Or if we have continuous blood glucose monitoring, you might say, well, their trends still are going up. You might figure out different ways to connect through social, uh, social means to care groups around patients. And so there's a bunch of different opportunities to think around how we as physicians can help inform that clinically, uh, but then offload things to have it not be such a kind of low fidelity interaction for taking care of some of these diseases that just require a higher fidelity touch point. Um, but I think what that also means is we haven't changed medical education in 100 years and yet everything else has changed significantly. So as physicians, we equally need to have a behavioral shift in how we use technologies to be more productive. Um, and so I think the business models around enabling that are as much around a regulatory movement and enabling that type of innovation as it is a behavioral change both on the consumers to being more engaged in an informed way with actionable data for them, as well as on the physician side of that doctor-patient relationship and, and changing the way we might engage than we historically have done. So uh, both of you are with uh, our physicians, and so I'm wondering, what's your take on how willing are doctors to adopt these new technologies? I'll let you Is that me? Yeah. I'll, I'll follow on. Okay. <laughs> Just, yeah. Um, you know, I do think that with with any new technology introduction, there tends to be a little hesitation, a little uneasiness, uh, some reservations. Um, in, in my personal experience, I'm an anesthesiologist by training. I remember a, a couple of years ago, we implemented a new system in the operating room that was going to automatically do all of the vital signs charting for us, whereas in the past, that was all done by pen and paper and so forth. And um, you know, we were going to install this new Philips system, and it was going to handle all of that. And there were a lot, of, uh, a lot of folks who were quite uneasy about that type of technology. Well, what if it's wrong? You know, like, you know, there's all these concerns, like you know, what, how do you ensure the data integrity and so forth? And 
it didn't take long for people to get over that uneasiness, and now it would, it's an indispensable piece of equipment. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I think there would be riots if you tried to remove that uh, and go back to the, to the old way. Um, so, you know, I do think it takes time generally to get people over, over that hump, but then once you get familiar with it and you kind of understand that it's, it's, it's not dangerous, it's there to help you, you can leverage it, it can be a very powerful tool, uh, then it becomes invaluable and indispensable. So I think it's relatively simple. Um, I actually think physicians adopt technology readily. Uh, Barrett's example actually helps uh, support that point. Um, they were, I like this example because it is a bit retro because they still use pagers, but they were one of the first populations to adopt pagers. <laughs> they were one of the first to adopt Palm Pilot, which then went away. They also are, in terms of compared to the general population, one of the highest users of smartphones. I think the reality is that there is a willingness by a highly intellectual, engaged, and caring individual to use technology that is useful. That begs the question of the current state of technology in healthcare, and I think part of the excitement of the stage and era we're in in healthcare is that to date, other than some, of, some small exceptions, the technology we've given them has been crap. So I think it's been very well documented that doctors just won't adopt crap. They'll ditch it because they, they'll stick to their core ways of doing things. And I think the inevitable view of of let's drag them kicking and screaming is, is the wrong view. It should be how do we engage them to help design things that help in their workflow. They, only they know best uh, the problems that Barrett helps solve on um, pressure ulcers. Uh, you know, like as a, you know, we need to help solve the problem as physicians of solutions in search of problems because we have a whole bunch of physicians who have a whole bunch of problems with no idea how to build the solutions. So there's that gap to bridge between mm -hmm. those. And if you bridge that gap with physicians in the conversation, then they inherently will be invested in what the solution is and therefore adopt it. And their assessment of it being crap or not can then be flipped. You know, just show them the mirror and say, well, what can we do to make it better? Um, and I think we've put them in a reactive position because of, because of EMRs, which you know, meaningful use, move forward, spend on EMRs, which then maybe didn't focus on use case and uh, user usability. And those types of things have made them more defensive in their stance on what's coming in the market. But I think there's certainly a way to break through that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the problem is how do we get technology developers and uh, Yeah, just like let's solve real use case problems. Align. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. Like. How do you create a dialogue like that? Is it as simple as appointing a CMO or well, Chief medical so, officer. I mean, thank, hopefully most of our doctors keep practicing medicine. That's good business for all of us who get sick. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think that we need to think of ways that we do engage them. And I do think that it is not enough to have a, the interesting thing about physicians are there's 900,000 plus of them, probably 600 to 700,000 actually practicing. And they practice in every state, in every county across the US. Half are probably Democratic, half are probably um, Republican, half mate still carry guns, who knows, but they are real people, they're kind of a reflection of the people they take care of, and I think what that means is, unlike Uber who's able to scale out solutions into rural areas where it works well with the populations they're targeting, in healthcare the problem's different. And so just having one point of view isn't enough, mm -hmm. and that begs the question of how you get a collective view, and that's something that's I think still evolving, how do we engage physicians and other care guide providers? I think Barrett's solution helps nurse issues as well. So how do we think about it as a more collective view of having that conversation be productive, um, but not have the trend of pulling physicians out of where we'd all prefer them to be, which is you know, practicing the art of medicine. Yeah, so we talk a lot about uh, technology and physicians, and one question I like to think about a lot is, can technology replace people? And I think that thinking about this question within the context of healthcare is especially interesting because doctors do represent uh, a very costly workforce. And so my question, my final question to you guys is, what do you think the future hospital or doctor will look like? Go wild. <laughs> a future hospital, um, well, Judging by where, what the state of the hospital environment is, um, healthcare workers are overworked. They feel overworked, and um, and I think that technology is going to be there to assist them uh, do their job. And it's just, it, it is really a matter of hearing uh, their needs and inventing solutions that assist them. Um, I, um, 
there is definitely um, a regulatory body in the government. That the recent um, American Investment and Recovery Act that earmarked 30 billion or so uh, to healthcare IT initiatives. I think that's another um, driver that's going to help modernize our healthcare system and, um, and with technology. So I think uh, the combination of these will propel us to a future where um, workflows more s streamlined and people feel good about using the technology to do their daily jobs. Mm -hmm. So I don't think technology is necessarily going to replace physicians, uh, at least anytime soon. But I think moving forward, we're going to lean more and more and more on technology. And just, uh, I mean, the Watson uh, presentation I found really compelling and really exciting. Mm -hmm. I, I think leveraging those types of decision support tools is going to become more and more important. Um, using, uh, you know, intelligence, uh, you know, cloud, um, you know, based decision algorithms and so forth is just going to become the way that we operate as physicians. Uh, it's going to be our new stethoscope where we, we turn to a, a bigger intelligence to look for answers and guidance. Um, there's just no way that any single individual is able to keep up with all the literature that's out there and, and, and understand all the interrelationships and interdependencies and it's just not possible. Um, but once we start to think about you know, the cloud intelligence, then you know, that, that is uh, becoming a reality. Um, what I would like to see in medicine is more uh, along the lines of what's going on in sort of the connected home environment. So when I go home, it's, you know, I've got my Philips Hue light bulbs talking to my uh, Amazon Alexa, connected to the you know, Sonos system. It's, everything's connected, and you've got your Nest going, and it's just this really nice ecosystem where everything is, is working together as a collective. And in the hospital, it's a, the technologies are a bit more siloed off, uh, and there's various reasons for that. But I, I would love to see those walls start to, to break away and um, allow us to develop a, you know, some type of platform or some mechanism, some method for interoperability and interconnectivity where otherwise disparate systems can now work together to provide even better data to, to help physicians. So I'll start with, uh, so 2047 is the 200 year anniversary of the AMA, uh, which is its inspirational vision to try to show and think about what healthcare looks like in the future. So we spend a fair amount of time thinking through some of these and then the reality of building it from the world we're in. Because uh, we don't just get to blow up the current system, we have to re-architect everything from the, the kind of status quo that we have. Um, so I start aspirationally as a physician, I want to be able to tell my daughter in whatever year she is deciding what to be, you know, rather than the trend you see of physicians nowadays telling children not, no, don't go be a doctor, you get overworked and it's a miserable experience, I want to be able to say it's the most technologically advanced profession where you get to save people's lives and you're actually at the forefront of thinking about technology that transform other industries as well. So how can we get to a point where we've leapfrogged enough with external technology into healthcare to get to a point where we can start to use the unique aspects of healthcare, whether it be security challenges of some of the most sensitive data that you come across in the world, to data transfer issues and challenges, to simplification of massive data sets. Like the Watson thing is really interesting. They're still thinking about what questions do we ask of it. You know, so you can imagine in the future, how do we get to a point where it's actually helping supplement physician care or supplement a nurse's care and triage things in the right manner? So from a global, like where healthcare could go perspective, we've done a great job in the last 50 years of, as I said in the beginning, navigating health to be from the acute to the more chronic. And now we have this unique challenge of solving the chronic piece. And I think it's really about helping people live better lives as they go through it. Let's give individuals actionable data that they don't have to go ask their doctor about that they can actually make on their own. But let's improve the doctor-patient relationship to be very, very high powered when they do come in. That's both making sure the individual's informed and the physician has the right information at their fingertips, whether that be clinical research that's relevant for this patient in this moment. So they don't have to go read reams of it, they can just read the most specific piece. And that they then can understand most, more specifically what's going on in that individual's life and they can understand the health narrative that exists there. So to me, it's all about all the solutions that come and pull that thing together. There's a whole bunch of regulatory challenges within the current system that we'll have to work through. But I think if we start from the right place, which we all are, it's why we're here today, we can get there. Yeah, and eventually how do we deliver care without having the patient needing to come? Yeah, the world of yeah. doctors not existing. I don't know if any of us, 
want that. Uh, I mean, I think we're still, sh <laughs> there's, uh, there's still the trust agent in the market. I think 60% yep. of people still trust what their doctor says over anyone else in the market. And uh, judging by your pull of the audience on, <laughs> on wearables, uh, how many trust what Fitbit would tell you to do related to your blood pressure medication. Um, so I think we have a ways to go on that front, but we can get there. Uh, we should be thoughtful on the physician side of what that looks like and how do we collaborate and build a bridge uh, to the companies that are innovating there, though. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Cool.